Good morning. It's a great day to be together for worship as the body of Christ here at West Salem Christian Church. I'm glad that you have made time to be here today, and I'm excited because uh, we get to go into the presence of our Heavenly Father and worship Him, and to express to Him how much we appreciate Him and love Him, and, and the gratitude that we have for all that He's done for us and all that He continues to do as He is at work in our lives, leading us and guiding us and, and helping us to step into His will. So let's make this morning all about God and giving Him praise and honor and glory together. Well, 
Well, good morning. Would you open your Bibles to the New Testament book of Titus, chapter 3, and we will read verses 3 through 7. Again, that is Titus, chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Please join me now as we pray to our generous and merciful Father. God of truth and of mercy, your name is holy and your word is true and all majesty and glory belong to you alone. Incredible are your works on earth and in heaven. The work of our prideful hands is worthless, but your work and word will stand forever. This morning, we are only able to come before you through the atonement of Jesus. Your will was that he would die for our sins and thus reconcile all who trust him and call him Lord and Savior. Examine us now as we do the same. We lay our sins down before you in repentance. Thank you for cleansing them and remembering them no more. Father, your amazing work, we pray that it will continue in the knitting of this church into your body. In doing so, you reveal your glory and love through sinners like us, who find unity in trusting you to use our diversity for your purposes. Empower the ministries you have created in this church to reach people with the good news of Christ. And may our hearts be aligned with your will in humble service. Bring, O Lord, change to our sinful land. Stir souls to realize the need for repentance and a return to you. We pray for leaders, great and small, that they may make godly decisions and block the work of those who oppose you. We lift up this morning to you the needs and concerns of the individuals in our church. Some we are aware of, but others only you know. Bring about comfort and healing for the physical ailments. Bring encouragement and strength to those battling spiritual attack. And most of all, may all of us rest in your comfort and hope for life eternal when our days here on earth reach their end. Thank you for giving so much to us, and may we joyfully give back to you our time, tithes, and offerings. We worship you through these things. We com commit the remainder of this service to you and bless Seth as he brings to us your word today. For we pray together in unity in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our church is a part of what's called the Restoration Movement, or sometimes people call it the Stone Campbell Movement of churches. And one of the things that's always been central to the Restoration Christian churches is communion. We participate in communion each time that we gather together for worship. There are other churches and Christian traditions where they take communion together every three or four months or just whenever they feel like it's a good time. And that's okay, but I 
personally find it meaningful that we get to consistently take communion together each week. But when we do that, there can be a danger of getting into a routine and sometimes not really thinking about all that communion means. For instance, when we use the word communion, uh, we're probably usually talking about a time of, you know, four or five minutes where we focus on the sacrifice of Jesus and we take the bread and the juice together. And there's really nothing wrong with that. But if that's the only way that we think about communion, we might be missing out a little bit. We hear it so often, we participate in it so often that we can sort of get stuck in a rut. So today I want to take a little closer look at a little bit more of what communion might mean. Actually, the word communion does not appear in the New Testament. Communion is a a label that we've put on our practice. Sometimes people call it the Lord's Supper, and that might be a little more accurate. We find Paul referring to it that way in the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians. But if you look up the definition of the English word communion, you'll find that it means an act or instance of sharing. And that's the definition of communion that I want to use today. So when you When I say communion during this message, I want us to think of an act or an instance of sharing, because communion is about sharing. But in the way that we normally do things in communion, is there a lot of sharing going on? A few years ago, before quarantine, we used to pass the trays and take the bread and the juice as the tray went by. And in that case, there was somebody handing you the emblems, and we would each take them at our own time. But now we have these little individually packaged cups with juice and a little wafer. And we just pick it up as we come into the building. But now at least we all take it at the same time and share in that. But in our tradition, we've lost some of the sharing nature of how communion started out. We've all probably heard the verses about when Jesus instituted communion in the upper room with his disciples at what we call the Last Supper. But I want to read Mark 14, 22 through 25 together. It says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Did you catch the first four words of that passage? It says, while they were eating. Jesus didn't get up and get special bread and wine out of a cupboard somewhere to use for, you know, to represent his body and his blood. The first communion was observed in the midst of a meal that they were already sharing together. It did have special meaning to them because it was the Passover meal. And if you look at all of the connections and the fulfillment that Jesus brought to the Passover, it really is amazing. But in that last supper, there was a lot more shared than just the bread and the wine. Jesus washed his disciples' feet. He explained to them what was about to happen and what was going to have to happen and the sacrifice he was going to make. And ultimately, he invited them to share not just in this meal with him, but to share in his kingdom. And that last supper points us toward God's intent for all of his creation. And what we see is that communion is God's ultimate goal. God created this world and created us so that he could have relationship with us and share his love with us and commune with us. Second Peter tells us that it's God's desire that all should come to repentance. And we see God's desire to share his love and his presence with us all through scripture. And I think sometimes because we talk about God's desire to have relationship with us so often, we can start to get a skewed view of God's motivation. Sometimes we can start to think that God created us because he needed us to complete him somehow, as if he needed us to fulfill his need for a relationship. But I think his motivation was different than that. Maybe the best analogy is to a couple when they decide to have children. When my wife, Christy, and I were dating, we had all the discussions that couples have when they start to get serious and think about their future lives together. We talked about goals and hopes and dreams and plans, and one of those major discussions that we had was about what our family would be like in the future, or what we hoped it would be. We discussed if we wanted to have children and how many kids we might want to have. And there are millions of couples who have had those same discussions. And there are all sorts of different sizes and shapes and types of families, 
And there can be varied motivations for couples to have kids, but in the best circumstances, couples decide to have children so that they can share the love, relationship, and the home that they have built together with their children. Parents know how much of a commitment it is to raise kids. From the early days of sleepless nights and endless diaper changes to the pain and disappointments that come through the years, having a family and children is not always a walk in the park. But for the most part, the motivation for having children is not because it's easy, but because it makes life richer to share life and the love and the family that we have with our children. And when we look at God as our Heavenly Father, His motivation is the same. God has always been in the most pure and complete community that has ever existed. As we look at the account of creation, we see that God, before the creation of the world, existed in complete and perfect unity and community in the Trinity. Now, that word Trinity is never found in the Bible either, but it's a concept that we see from the very beginning. In fact, in the very first two verses of the Bible, we read this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So we see both God the Father and the Spirit existing together before the creation of the world. Then at the beginning of the Gospel of John, he writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing, nothing, nothing was made that has been made. And when John talks about the word here, he's referring to Jesus. So all through scripture, we get this picture of one God existing in three eternally distinct people, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God has eternally existed in this perfect communion and relationship with himself. And as we consider that relationship that exists in the Trinity, it shows us that God did not create the world and humankind out of a, a need for relationship, but out of a desire to share his communion with us. In his book, Come to the Table, Dr. Mark, John Mark Hicks writes, when the Trinitarian community decided to create, they decided to share something they already enjoyed for the benefit of another. We humans did not create that fellowship, but it was offered to us in love. God created out of his love. He did not create in order to receive as if he needed anything outside of himself, but he created to give and consequently experience the joy of communion with others. Thus, the act of creation is an act of grace, an act of selfless love. God created us so that we could have the joy of experience the communion, that he, of the relationship that he shared at the heart of who he is. And as we look at his actions through scripture and with his people and his church, we see that communion comes through covenant. Once again, this is something that we see from the very beginning of scripture. When God creates Adam and Eve as the pinnacle of his creation, there's an agreement and a covenant between God and his people that their relationship and their communion is based on. God creates the world, tells Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth. And then in Genesis chapter 2, we're told that there are two trees in the middle of the garden, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then in verses 15 through 17, it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. That was it. That was the one stipulation that God put on this covenant with Adam and Eve. He gave them all the earth and everything in it except for one tree. But Adam and Eve were deceived by the serpent and they chose to do the one thing that God told them not to do. They ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that covenant, that relationship, that communion that they had enjoyed with God was broken. And the rest of the Old Testament, we see God at work making covenants with his people. He made a covenant with Noah. He made a covenant with Abraham. He made a covenant with Jacob. And he made a covenant with the descendants of Israel when he brought them up out of Egypt. In Exodus chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, it says, I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you up out of 
under, out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Well, along with this covenant, God gave them the Ten Commandments, and the covenant with Israel was based on their obedience or disobedience. And for a while, it was great. For, for a time, they had a communion with God that was as close to anyone uh, as anyone had ever had since the Garden of Eden. For a while, they had the presence of God with them in their camp, in the tabernacle, the portable temple that they built. But after not too long, that covenant and that communion was broken because of the disobedience of God's people. And we see this cycle of repentance and then disobedience of God's people again and again through the rest of the Old Testament. But God was still at work. He was still working to keep his promises and his desire was still to have community and communion with his people. And we see the culmination of that plan in Jesus. The original communion came through creation. Our communion comes through redemption. God shared himself and his presence with Adam and Eve as a free gift through creation. But then separation came because of sin. But now we have access to the presence of God because of the free gift of his son, Jesus Christ, and the sacrifice that he made for us. The old covenants were never complete. People could never live up to the terms because they could not keep from disobeying God. And under those old covenants, we're dead in our sins too. All of us have missed the mark, fallen short. But when we read the account of the Last Supper in Luke 22, 19 and 20, we see that we're not under the old covenant anymore. It says, and he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. The new covenant is established by the body and the blood of Jesus that he sacrificed for us on the cross. And each and every individual who chooses to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior will receive forgiveness, salvation, and new life in that new covenant. And that is a very personal decision that each of us must come to on our own. But that doesn't mean that our communion with God is isolated and completely personal. In our Western culture, we have made communion, the practice of that, into a very solemn, personal, introspective time. And there's definitely a place for that. And it's, it's one very appropriate way to observe communion. But what we see in the early church is that communion was done just like it was the first time when Jesus did it. It was done as a part of a meal that the church shared together when they met together. Communion can and often should be a time of, of celebration and gratitude shared together for what we have been given in Jesus. When we think of the victory that Jesus won, even though it took such an immense sacrifice, we should be excited and overjoyed that we get to share in that victory. Communion should build community in the church. We don't usually take communion alone. We take communion when we're together as a church family, when we're gathered as the body even if that gathering is online. Communion is a family affair and a time when we remember the one thing that truly binds us together as a body, the unity that we find in Jesus. Remember the definition of the word communion is an act or an instance of sharing. For us, it's a family meal that we share together and with Jesus. When I was in high school, there was a kid named Jimmy. And one year... He went through some pretty hard times. I'm pretty sure he ended up living on his own, even as a high school student. He really didn't have anyone, but he was on the wrestling team, and his coaches and his teammates were there for him. And during that year, during wrestling season, people thought Jimmy might struggle because of all that he was going through. But at the end of the season, he had qualified for the state wrestling meet. I still remember being in the crowd for that meet. I remember it clearly. Everybody from our crowd was pulling for Jimmy because we knew how hard he had worked. And, and as we got into the later rounds of the state tournament, the, the atmosphere was getting more and more electric. As the day wore on, Jimmy, uh, Jimmy kept winning and, and he ultimately made it to the final match. Everybody was on the edge of their seats because we knew just how much Jimmy had to overcome to get to this moment. He and his opponent were extremely evenly matched and it was this low scoring battle and 
it was deafening in there as the crowd was screaming and cheering. And it was, it was the final round and Jimmy was down by one point. His the opponent was on top of him and the time was running down. There were only a few seconds left and it looked like there really wasn't any way Jimmy could win. Then he was able to, to get his arm up and around on top of his opponent, but the guy still had him in a headlock. If Jimmy could get his head free, he might just have a chance. He was pulling and struggling, but his, his opponent was holding on tight and the time was ticking away. And then with literally like two seconds on the clock, Jimmy pulled his head free and the referee gave the signal for a two-point reversal and it was over. Jimmy had won by one point. And there was a moment where you could hear like a, a pin drop and then the crowd just erupted. People were cheering and laughing and hugging. And these grizzled loggers and mill workers were crying and high-fiving each other. And Jimmy just got up and he ran around the whole outside of the mat like three times, pumping his fist in the air. And then he just went to the middle of the mat and he fell on his knees. And I've been to college sports games and professional football, basketball, hockey, and baseball games. And I can tell you that was by far the most intense and exciting moment in sports that I've ever witnessed. And that's because we were all in it together. That whole crowd was hanging on every moment because we knew just what it took to get to that moment. And, and when the victory came, it was a huge celebration. Now, Jesus won the victory over sin and death, and that's a whole lot bigger than a high school wrestling championship. And we should celebrate. We are part of the new covenant, a covenant where his blood purifies us from all sin. We all get to share in that victory together as, as a body and as a church family here and, and with Christians all around the world. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You have a family here at this church. You have a great cloud of witnesses here cheering you on. And together, we have a lot to celebrate. So I want to ask you if you have the items at home to use to observe communion, to get those now. And I, I want to take them together as a family to celebrate and share together the victory that we have in Jesus. So let's take the bread together to remember his body that he gave for us on the cross. And let's take the juice to remember the new covenant in his blood, the covenant that ensures our salvation and our forgiveness, and the covenant in his blood that purifies us from all sin. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you want communion with us. You want to be with us, to share with us. And, and you love us enough that you want to share your love and your, your community and your unity with us. We know that you don't need us, but we see through everything that you've done that you want us. You want us to know you. You want us to experience what it's like to truly have your presence with us. We're grateful that you have sent Jesus for us to allow us to, to have that opportunity, to be part of that new covenant with you. We're grateful you've given us your spirit so that we have you with us all the time, your presence guiding us and, and, uh, and leading us. We're grateful that you've made us a part of this body, that while we have a personal relationship with you through Jesus, we also are part of a great cloud of witnesses. We're part of a, a family where we can commune with you and with each other together. We love you, and we are grateful that you love us so much. And we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. the mountain 
I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name Into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ, my living Lord Who could imagine So great a mercy What heart could fathom Such boundless grace the God of ages stepped down from glory to bear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. This is our time of giving. Today in the message, we talked about how the definition of communion is a act or an instance of sharing. And we can, when we think about giving, we can easily make that connection between 
giving and and sharing. I want to read a few verses from Acts chapter 2 that talks about the early church and the way that they shared both in in communion, uh, in a meal together, and in everything that they had. Beginning in verse 42, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the mighty wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And just like the early church, we all share together in the mission of Jesus and in the ministry of the church. Part of that is giving. Part of that is sharing together as as we uh, receive blessings from God. We we give back part of that to him and to his church and to his mission in this world. And as we share together, we are able to see the fruits of, of what God can do and how he can bless uh, this, this church and, and uh, the, the ministries that we have uh, when, we, when we work together and we share together as we give and uh, as we serve together as well. So I want to invite you to, uh, to give today if God moves you to do that. And I want to invite you to, uh, to consider finding a place to, to get plugged in and to serve and to, to find a role uh, to, to serve God uh, through the, the ministry of the church so that we together uh, can, can work toward his will and his mission. Thank you again for being part of this time of worship. I want to encourage you this week to each day allow God to continue to share himself with you to experience the presence of God because he wants to give himself to you. He wants to share himself with you. So open yourself up to him, ask him for more of himself and step into those opportunities that he he gives you to to, uh, live out his will and to impact this world for him. We'll be back next week at 10.30 a.m. here online and in person at the church building. I want to invite you to to be a part of that, to commune with God and with his people, to to gather as the body, uh, to, to be in the presence of God. Let's pray as we get ready to sing our closing song today. Father, we're grateful for who you are. We know that you are love, and you have shown us your love so clearly in Jesus. We pray that we would show that love to each other and to the people around us in this world because we know that that love that you have makes a difference, makes a difference in our lives, and we know it can make all the difference in the lives of the people around us too. So we pray you would just give us opportunities to to, uh, live out your will this week and that you would work through us to accomplish all the things that, that you want us to do. We love you and we trust you and we give ourselves to you today in the name of Jesus. Amen. There's a grace when the heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closing in When I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I would never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me There was another in the water Holding back the sea should I ever need reminding How I have been set free There is a cross that bears my burden Where another died for me There is another in the fire Oh 
Oh, my death left for death beneath the waters. I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore. Should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning? Either way, I will bow to the things of this world. I know I will never be alone There is another in the fire Standing next to me There is another in the water Holding back the sea Should I ever be reminded What power set me free There is a grace that holds nobody Now that power lives in me there is another in the fire. Oh, there is another in the fire. Oh, there is another in the fire. Oh, there is another in the fire. darkness as the darkness bows to him i can hear the roar in the heavens as the space between where thin i can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls gave in nothing stands between us nothing stands between There is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come what may in the space between all the things I've seen and this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. Yeah, I know I will never be alone. There'll be another in the fire Standing next to me There'll be another in the water Holding back the seas Should I ever need reminding How good you've been to me I'll count the joy from every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy from every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be